God's doing some really cool stuff in the life of our church, and um, I'm excited to get to lead this sermon series uh, on Ephesians as we look at uh, Paul's letter to a church, which I think the first thing uh, we discover in studying this uh, is that the oldest manuscripts in, uh, in, in, you know, that are available of Ephesians uh, actually don't have Paul's word to writing this letter to the Ephesians. It's actually uh, meant to be spread around to many other churches. And so sort of the starting point for us is that this letter that Paul wrote really was for us today. And, and what I mean by that is it was meant for churches everywhere and for all ages. And so what we hear today, I believe, is as applicable and relevant for us sitting here in Long Beach 2024 um, as it was to the first readers uh, that Paul wrote it to. And so I'm really excited to get to walk through that, especially in our church as we sort of turn the page on a new chapter. Um, it, I believe, is going to give us some very clear direction on what it means to be faithful to uh, God's design and purpose for the church. Um, this, this letter that Paul writes is indeed a, uh, it is almost like a prescription for what does it mean to be the church. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to dig kind of deep into this, and uh, I'm excited about being able to do that with you. Um, in fact, um, one commentator writes this, that Ephesians reveals the position and job description of the church in affecting God's new order. It answers the question, what does it mean to be in Christ, and what does it demand of us? He goes on to say that for every church, it is for every church in every age, which includes us, that Christ reconciles all races, cultures, uh, and cultures by bringing us, or bringing them, including us, to himself, and making them and us one with him and one with each other. Unity for the church in a fragmented world. And if that doesn't define who we are, I don't know what does. And so, um, if you'll pray with me, God, that is indeed our prayer, that you would take um, these words, the truth of your scripture, that they would pierce our hearts, that they would transform us, change us, that they would give us a clear vision of what it means to be the church, not just this church, but to be the church, to be your bride, to be your body, your representative to the world. God, humble us to a point where we're ready to receive all that you would have for us and from us. Lord, we believe that you have a plan and a purpose for us individually, us as a church, and even for your kingdom. And so meet us here, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear that we might be who you've called us to be. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So Ephesians starts out, Paul literally writing a letter, and there is this greeting. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing uh, to God's holy people in Ephesus, uh, and, and my Bible has an asterisk there, which again, uh, is really written to Christians everywhere, the faithful followers of Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And then he goes on to offer this blessing. He says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven and on, or, or in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Pause. We're going to stop right there. That's enough. We need to talk for a second, right? So <clears throat> Paul's writing this letter to churches everywhere. Specifically, it's going out to the church at Ephesus to begin with. But he's reminding them first and foremost, of where they stand with God, of what God feels or thinks about them, right? And, and the thing that Paul points out is that long before you ever showed up and started breathing air, God knew you. He could see far in advance. God lives beyond the bounds of space and time, and he can see everything as it was and is and will be as, it is, as if it is right now. And so God sees who we are, who we will become. And even knowing all of that, he chose, number one, to create us, but he chose to include us. 
all praise and glory, or, or all praise to God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He says, even before the world was made, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. In other words, he chose us to set us apart. First point, it's going to be a great sermon today. There's three points, right? So you can kind of gauge how far we're moving. Just kidding. It goes a little faster at the end, I promise. But the first part is simply this. God chose you. Let me say that again. God chose you. God chose you. You didn't stumble upon him. You didn't find him. He chose you. God is the great initiator of our faith, and it is by his grace that he chose you. And and the reason I say that is because I need you to understand God's heart toward you. My dad, I love him. He might be watching. Hey, um, he really said this. He said when when Emily and I were first, uh, we were dating, and I don't remember if we had decided to get married, if I'd asked her to marry her, or maybe it may have been even early in our our, our marriage. But I remember he looked at at her and and said this. He said, uh, you picked him, we were stuck with him. (laughs) He said, you picked him, we're stuck with him. And (laughs) God bless him. He loves me, and I love him. Uh, but but he wasn't wrong. He wasn't wrong. Now, I mean, granted, we, we, we went the right channel, right? I met with her mom and dad, and I asked her to marry. But, I mean, she had a full good choice to say no, and I'm sure she had to think about that long and hard. But at the end of the day, love is a choice, right? And so, and so she probably just didn't know what all she was getting into, but she, she chose to say yes. I remember when we... Uh, when we first started having, having children, when we brought our first kid home from uh, the hospital, right? We, we left Memorial Hospital, we strapped them in, you know, pillows and blankets and stuffed them, all that. I won't say which one it is, although you could probably do the math and figure out that it was Sadie. Um, but that's up to you to try to figure out. Um, and so we're, we're coming home, and, uh, and, and, and well-intended people warned us, right? They told us what to expect right? You'll never sleep again a day in your life, right? You'll never have a full night's sleep. Um, you'll be exhausted from this point forward until you're old, and then you're probably still going to be exhausted then. Um, you, um, you will no longer live for yourself. Like, you, your priority will no longer be you. And, and there was a whole host of other uh, warnings. And so when we came home with our child, there, there was no, there was, there was, I mean, I think at some level there may have been a little bit of a shock, <clears throat> But honestly, we, we knew what we were getting into, right? And yet we still chose, we, we want to have kids. Like that was a desire of our heart as a married couple. We want to have kids. So much so we decided to have three more. And uh, Lord have mercy. Uh, but even knowing what that would be like, we still chose to do so. And so what I want you to hear from this as we, as we, as we kick off this entire series, right, First and foremost, out of the gate, uh, bef- when God, before you ever breathe air, right? The God of the universe who created all that is, who knew how you would respond. He knew everything about, uh, about um, Adam and Eve. Before, like, he knew all of that. And yet he still created them and he still loved them and he still put into place a plan of redemption for their life. And so, first and foremost, God chose you. And he knows you. And he still chooses you. And he wants you to be part of his family. One of my favorite lines here, uh, there's two in this, this first part that I think are just golden for setting the stage for this, book, this letter that Paul writes. The first part is that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. Going back to what my dad said, <laughs> we were stuck with him, you picked him, you chose him, Right? And so the reality is this, that God, knowing you and knowing me and knowing everything about us, chose to intentionally pick us out and say, I want you to be part of my family. And it wasn't just a God chose you because he thought you might be helpful in the kingdom. It wasn't that God chose you because he thought, boy, I could use that one. He's smart on this or he's, she's good on that, right? No, you're adopted into the family, which is an, a level of intimacy. It is the deepest level of intimacy to be part of someone's family. And we are chosen and adopted 
by God through Christ. Right? The, the, it goes on to say, um, this, this is the second favorite part. Really, it might be the actual favorite if we're, if we're waiting things. But at the end of verse 5, he says, this is what, this is what Paul says. He says, this is what Jesus wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. <clears throat> I'm, or my, I told you about my dad. My mom and dad are some of the greatest, greatest parents you'll, you'll find. They're absolutely generous. They're gracious. Uh, the grandparents on the other side, in the same way, absolutely generous and gracious, even as a, as a dad, I would say, to a fault, right? Um, some of y'all know what those grandparents are like. You know, I look at them, and I'm like, they, they don't need that much ice cream at midnight, people, like, Right? Like, they, they just don't. And, and, and so you look at them and you wonder, like, why do they do what they do, right? Because they can, right? <laughs> I can tell you why they do it. Because it gives them great pleasure to pour out their love on their grandchildren. And if our grandparents, who even faulted as they are, can love and serve and give like that. Imagine the heart of God who looks at you every single day and knows everything about you inside and out, knows every thought, every feeling, says, that one's mine, and I, he belongs to me, and I'm going to do everything within my power to draw him out and to redeem her life and to bring resurrection to that dead soul. That's how much God loves you. God chose you. And it gave him great pleasure. I have to say this, and I don't know how theologically accurate it is, but it, it certainly works in my brain and my understanding of the Scripture. These are only Ben's words. But I want to say, God ain't mad at you. It's just proper, trust me. God ain't mad at you, right? Now, does God detest sin? A hundred percent. Sin's getting in the way of his incredible love for you, right? So God's not, will God deal justly with our sin? A hundred percent. He puts it on the back of Jesus for crying out loud, right? And so to say that God chose you and he's not mad at you is not to say that God doesn't detest sin. It just means that God loves you to the core of your being so much so that he would sacrifice his own son in order to reconcile us all to himself. Let me say that again. He loves us enough that he would give his own son, sacrifice his own son, that he might reconcile us all to himself. God loves you. He chose you. Before you ever breathe there, he adopted you and said, that one's mine. I don't know about you, but that should at least set the stage for an understanding that there's no greater love for one another. There's no greater love for humanity than the love of God in Christ Jesus. And, and not only, and we, some of y'all were at the discipleship training earlier, and some of you will join later, and you'll, you'll hear me say this, but we understand God as triune, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? One God, three persons, that's about as far as I know how to explain it, okay? Because it is a mystery, and I don't fully understand, and anybody that does, I don't think it's properly wrestled with it long enough. But God is triune. And so not only does the Father give up his Son, but understand that the Son willingly says, in order to rescue my creation, Jesus was present at creation as well, right? And so Jesus willingly limited himself and moved here on earth to become like us so that he might take our sin on and die in our place to reconcile and redeem, to make it possible for his father to adopt us and make us his own. You're bought with a high price. You're paid by a ransom. Jesus has made a way. Jesus has made a way. He is so rich. Our, our memory verse for this week is verse 7. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. His the richness of his kindness. That's the picture of grace. There's no end to what he would do in order 
to buy you back and to buy me back, to pay the ransom. You and I were bought with a price, and it comes to us as a free gift because of the love of God in Christ who said, I am willing to lay it all down that you might be part of this family. God loved you, and God chose you, costly, yet so willing to pay. So the second part, see, look there, we're already past number one, moving right on to number two. We move on down a little bit further in the verses, and we, we read this, verse eight, or verse nine, I'm sorry. God has now revealed to us a mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure, and this is the plan. This is the plan. At just the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we received an inheritance from God, and he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. So, God chose you, and he has a plan. He's got a plan, and you and I are part of the plan. And so not only does God have a plan for us as individuals, but God has a plan for the church. And not only does God have a plan for individuals and the church, but he has a plan for the kingdom. And we all work together moving toward that end so that one day, one day, Jesus will return and make everything right. Revelation 21 tells us that there's coming a day when every tear will be wiped clean from your face, there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more shame. For all the old things will be gone and the new will come. We don't always make a big deal about Christ's ascension, but even after Jesus is resurrected, not only has he paid the penalty for our sin and been raised to new life so that you and I can live eternally with him, but at his ascension, he returns to the Father so that we might receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, but also that he might stand on go, ready to bring this new kingdom into being. There's a plan. You and I as the church, you and I as individuals, you and I as part of the larger church, the kingdom of God, get to be part of what God is doing, his plan and his purpose to be brought forth. And throughout this book, throughout this letter that Paul writes, we are going to discover what that purpose looks like. We're going to discover what God would have for us, what God would have from us, what he wants to do through us. At just the right time, he'll bring everything under the authority of Christ. One day a trumpet will sound. It seems the way it's going to work out. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is indeed Lord and Lord of all. And you and I, because we've been adopted, have an opportunity to declare that even now. Even now. The beauty of this is that we as the church get to sit, those who have, who have received this gift of eternal life, those who have received the reality of his adoption get to be part of that plan. We get to sit front and center and be a part of helping others realize the love of God in Christ. And we get to tell those who feel that they are so far apart from God and anyone who cares about anything in their life, we get to look at them and say, God loves you and he chose you. And you belong to him. Before the foundation of the earth, when he knew everything about you, even before you were born, he still chose you. He still wants to live with you so much so that he would send his only son. You and I get to be part of that. We get to tell that story every Sunday as we gather here and even every Monday through Saturday when we live out our life, we get to tell the world. We get to join in the narrative that is God's saving work in the world through Christ. We have eternal life. That's point number two. Now we're on number three. We're flying, aren't we? And I can tell the excitement. I can see it in your eyes. I appreciate it. It's the beauty of getting to do a trial run at the beginning. We can just kind of breeze right on through this. Third part is no one is exempt. Let me explain what I mean by that. As we continue to read, as we continue to read, this is what Paul says, God's purpose, verse 12, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth. 
the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. In the beginning, the Jews were set apart, right? They were God's chosen and holy people, the ones he loved, the ones who were adopted and chosen by God. But it was never meant to land on them alone. God's call in their life, the, the gift of grace to them, was that they got to live in perfect relationship with him as an example to the world so that others might want to be part of that family and realize that they too were adopted. They failed, as we have too many times before, but it, it is in Christ that he opens the door for all. And so when I say no one is exempt, I'm not talking about some kind of universal theology where just because God loves us, we're all saved and rescued, but rather that there's a universally applied grace that invites us all to receive this incredible gift that God wants to give to us. This gift of adoption, this gift of you are mine, holy and beloved child that belongs to me. You've been bought with a price. And it's not just for certain people. It's not just for the holy. It's not just for the Jewish. It is for everyone. It's for the dirty old Gentiles. Paul, who's writing this, I totally skipped over the entire part where I painted a picture for you of the context in which Paul's writing. Maybe we'll talk about that next week brief part of that is that Paul's writing from prison, right? This entire letter is written while he is in chains. Interestingly enough, Paul himself, Paul himself once threw people in jail because they were following in the way, the way of Jesus. Paul was a pedigree Jew, right? He said it himself. He said, righteousness under the law, perfect, right here. I had it all. I did it all right. In fact, it was his goal in life to snuff out any movement of the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaims. So much so that he went town to town trying to find people who were out to destroy, who were out to advance this kingdom. And he had permission to lock them up and do away with them in whatever way possible. And it was on that road to Damascus where Jesus literally knocked him off his high horse, blinded him, and he came to a saving understanding of Jesus. Like his eyes literally were closed and blinded, and yet they were open to the grace of God in Jesus. And his life literally did a 180-degree turn, and he, at that point, no longer, no longer persecuted Christians, but now he was the one in charge of the church planting movement, right? It was on his back to go and spread the gospel, and so, and so now he's in jail because he's doing the things that he was arresting people for before himself, right? And so, so out of this, out of this, Paul, who again, a perfect Jew, who lived by the law and who counted it, counted it his righteousness, right? Until he met Jesus and realized, as he said himself, my righteousness is as filthy rags, worthless, except for knowing Christ. That's all that matters. And, and so now Paul is speaking once again to Jewish people and saying to them, hey, Jesus is a real deal. <laughs> you should get on board, right? You should get on board. And by the way, it's not just for y'all anymore. It's for everybody. And for a, for a Jewish person who at one time was so legalistic and living by the law to even say these words, it's just blasphemy. It's ridiculous. But then again, the grace of God is ridiculous. It is the absolute unmerited favor of God who looks at us knowing who we are and loves us still, even so much so that he would buy us back. Sold to, the ran sold to, the, to slavery to sin, you and I are bought with the ransom of Christ. And we are issued into freedom. So, we are his own. And by the gift of his Holy Spirit, we are sealed, signed, named, claimed. We belong to him. We belong to him.
So as we start this conversation around what it means to be the church, what does it mean to be the gathered body of believers? What does it mean to walk with Christ? Be reminded right out of the gate. Be reminded right out of the gate that first and foremost, God loves you and he chose you and he wants you to be his own and he's gone to incredible sacrificial measures to make that happen. That's, that's a, an undertone that will roll through this entire conversation. All of this is out of God's love for you. Will he call us away from sin? Yeah, why? Because he loves us. Because we belong to him. Will, will, will he invite us to, to ourselves, give sacrificially and offer ourselves in service? Probably so. Why? Because he loves us. Because we belong to him. Why would he do that? Because his love to bring us to places where we can experience joy like we've never experienced before. Walking in the humble obedience of Christ, we will find joy in the faithfulness. So, what do we do? What do we do? Well, first and foremost, just this is, like I said, we're just getting started. So first and foremost, you are, you're chosen and loved by God, right? He has a plan for your life, for this church and the kingdom of God. And, and you and I, you and I get to share that with everyone. Everyone is a candidate for God's transforming grace. Everyone is a candidate for God's transforming grace. And we get to be part of that. So, first invitation is this. If you've never trusted Jesus to be your Lord, to be your Savior, to be the one who has adopted you, who has made a way for God's love to be made known real in your life, there's no better day than today. There's no better day than today to say, Lord, I, I don't understand why this love is so great. You, if you only knew, he already knows. If you know, Lord, then why would you love me? Because you're mine. You belong to me. It's the same, it's the same way even as a parent, even as a grandparent. Your kid can do some pretty dumb things. Your grandchild can say some pretty bad things. Your love still for them is there because not of what they've done, but because of who they are. And God's love for you is not going to change. And he wants to redeem you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to deliver you. So if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord, today's a great day to do that. I'd love to pray with you. You're welcome to come down here, tap me on the shoulder, find me after the service. It doesn't have to happen right here and now. There's no better time than now. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time. Maybe the Lord is leading you deeper in your level of faith. And I would say this sermon series, this conversation, there's no better opportunity for you today than for you today to put a marker in the ground and say, this is the day I'm going to take serious what it means to be the church, what it means to be the bride of Christ, what it means to be a part of others who are on this journey, and I'm going to surrender my life fully to Jesus. And I'm going to allow him to have complete reign and control. So whatever his word says, I will do. Wherever he says go, I'll go. Whatever he says to give, I'll give. Whatever he says to, to, to take, I'll take. That's, that's where I'm at. There's no better time than today to make that response. So the band's going to come and lead us in a closing song. Run to the Father. They're going to lead us. There's pads sort of in line here. Uh, welcome to come up here, and you can kneel and pray. I'll be hanging out over here on the other side of that speaker. I'll be glad to pray with you about anything, whether it's about following Jesus for the first time, whether it's about something that you're wrestling with in your life. I believe God is ready to move and do great things in the life of our church and in the life of those in our church. And I'm excited to see what he does in and through you. God, that is our prayer, that you would move and work, that you would do miracles, that you would deliver, that you would heal. God, that you would once again do today what you've done in the past. We're here, Lord. We're yours. Have your way in us. May we be found faithful and obedient in everything we do. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.